The actor Josh Hartnett is an interesting case study in the life cycle of a Hollywood leading man. In recent years, he's seen a much-deserved resurgence after taking a detour into mid-level Hollywood fare, after the business tried to transfer his teen idol heartthrob good looks into a career as a megastar leading man. Hollywood has a history of unsuccessfully manufacturing megastars. We've all seen this phenomenon in motion. Suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, a fresh-faced, ruggedly handsome stranger to audiences will be thrust into high-profile release after high-profile release. And this trend will continue for a while, even after the movies fail critically and commercially, until the actor has exhausted all of the town's patience and is relegated to less high-profile films. Not such a bad fate, considering they got a shot most actors will never get, and are able to make a steady living out of it. Hartnett first came to my attention with the late 90s slasher Halloween H2O. I was a big horror fan at the time, and while the film was nothing to write home about, Hartnett caught my attention with a kind of screen presence and command of physicality that made him hard not to notice. The film did well at the box office, and Hartnett's career was about to go into overdrive. Movies like The Faculty, The Virgin Suicides, and Pearl Harbor solidified his place among the late 90s, early 2000s crop of young male Hollywood heartthrobs like Ryan Phillippe, Joshua Jackson, Freddie Prince Jr., James Marsden, Tobey Maguire, Leonardo DiCaprio, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and James Vanderbeek. But Hartnett was also on his way down a path similar to other familiar actors who the town once sprinkled with A-list magic fairy dust, but then unceremoniously tossed aside. But unlike those other actors, it wouldn't be because the movies failed to gain critical and financial success, but because Hartnett was reluctant about his rise to stardom. Famously turning down offers to play Superman, of which he would have been paid a salary of $100 million over three films, and then Batman in Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, the part eventually going to Christian Bale. Hartnett's career stall was of his own making. He had a grounded personality and was wary of the harsh glare of the limelight. He seemed more interested in the artistic side of the business, rather than the one dominated by box office juggernauts. Hartnett's co-star in 40 Days, 40 Nights, Shannon Sossaman, was another actor who was hesitant to jump into the deep end of the Hollywood star factory. The story is that after those two movies, you kind of thought about dropping out of the business, and that you were actually working, I think, in a record store for a while, and you decided you really didn't like acting anymore, and you, you had said that you felt empty after making those two movies. Were you feeling empty? What was going on in that moment where these two kind of big movies had happened, and you were feeling, I don't know what, vulnerable, lost, maybe this wasn't the right thing for you? And suddenly, uh, what's going on? In, what's in your mindset in that period? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. I, I remember a little bit. I remember feeling very a lot of fear and anxiety. Really? Yes. The first two movies, it, the, the, it was fun. And obviously, the money was really great. And I met a lot of people and I got to travel. But I just rem it, it just felt scary. It felt like y you have to be prepared for this business. Yes. You have to want to be an actor and have studied the business and right. understand the big machine before you're thrown in. And I knew a lot of people that did care about me and love me and protected me to the best of their ability, but it, they didn't really have the um, information or knowledge to protect me in the way that I needed to be protected. And so I was feeling very vulnerable. This is a part of the business that doesn't make a lot of headlines. Actors who are expected to represent the machine and whose personal feelings and hesitations can often be a detriment to this strict Hollywood mandate. In this sense, she and Hartnett seemed kindred spirits. I can't help but wonder what Hartnett would have brought to the table to Superman and Batman that Henry Cavill and Christian Bale wouldn't have. Hartnett's refusal to don a pair of tights was the beginning of a wave of Hollywood recruiting well-known and beloved actors for their mega comic book franchises. With the business shifting heavily towards more risk-averse, generic, and safe material, actors became increasingly less able to channel their stardom into the kind of big-budget adult fare that populated cinemas for decades. More money went to beloved fan-focused franchises, which meant that there was less money for the more mid-budgeted films that the industry had always been willing, eager even, to release in theaters. The mid-budget film 
became more of a television product, getting buried under the massive wave of streaming content that became Hollywood's latest obsession. That word content has become more and more part of our lexicon as an entertainment-focused culture. The idea of content was much closer to the word product than cinema or film or movie. The latter terms are what separated the artistic medium of cinema from the bite-sized, flashy, and disposable YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok videos that would capture more and more eyeballs as the culture shifted from water-cooler conversations to texting sessions. More interestingly, this new form of audience engagement began to signal the end of the movie star as we know it. Sure, there are still famous actors, but they were no longer the centerpiece of a movie studio's arsenal. As Quentin Tarantino now famously quipped, Part of the marvelization of Hollywood is you have all these actors who have become famous playing these, these parts, characters, yeah, yeah. but they're not movie stars. Captain America is the star. Right. Thor is the star. Uh, I mean, I'm not the first person to say that. I think that's been said a zillion times, you know, but it's like, you know, it's the, these franchise characters that become, become a star. You know, okay, here's a better way to say it. It's like, you know, before even 2005, 2009 or something like that. If an actor stars in a movie that does as good as the, the Marvel movies do, well, that, that guy's a new star. They're an absolute star. And that means that people dig him or her. Yeah. And they like them and they want to see them and stuff. And then, then they, you know, uh, Sandra Bullock is in Speed. All right. And everyone like thought she was amazing in it. All right. She was charming as hell. Everyone fell in love with her. And so, you know, even she does a couple of uh, mediocre movies after that. Okay, well, people want to see it because they, 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 they were like excited Sandra by Bullock. Sandra Bullock. They yeah. want to see her in something else. And she's good in those movies, but that's not the case now. No, no we want to see that guy playing Wolverine or whatever. <laughs> The franchise and its iconic heroes were now the star, and audiences really didn't care who played these fantastical characters, as long as they were able to do them justice. And actors were not only knocked down a peg because of this, they were also forced to begin to compete with a new wave of celebrity, the content creator. YouTube and TikTok stars, Instagram and OnlyFans models, Twitch streamers, and God knows what else I'm missing. These new faces muddled the waters of what it meant to be an actor. Many of these content creators were also acting, playing a part, but they were catering to a market that was increasingly obsessed with their smartphones rather than a giant cinema screen. In previous Hollywood generations, and especially in the earlier days of the town, movie stars were enigmatic. There was a mystique about them, an aura, that made them closer to fictional gods than real people. This is because access to them was extremely limited. If you wanted to know anything about your favorite movie star, you had to trek down to wherever magazines and books were sold and let the words and photographs paint a picture in your mind of these titans. Pre-2000s, actors were seen in gossip rags or interviewed in heavily sanctioned entertainment news pieces or late-night TV shows. All of this restricted access was deliberate. The studios understood the value of obscuring their greatest commodities in a fog of mystique and intrigue. They understood that the more awe you could bestow upon an actor, the more money audiences would be willing to spend to see them on a giant silver screen. But today is very, very different. The giant silver screen is more of an afterthought. The screens that matter today are the tiny ones on a person's phone or the slightly larger ones on their laptop and smart TV. What used to be restricted access via magazines and news stories was now a free-for-all orgy of information via the internet where nothing was off limits. Celebrities no longer had the mystique they once counted on to bolster their public personas. Their lives were laid bare for all to see, anytime, anywhere, as long as you carried your phone. This created a schism in the way that movies were presented to the public. Since little mystique remained, the giant silver screen was reserved for the biggest, loudest, and most popular pre-built-in fan-based properties the town could get their hands on. And since these movies were so expensive to produce, they had to be as generic and all-inclusive as possible. The more generic the franchises, the more generic the characters. And as a result, the actors' artistic desires took a back seat. And even if they could cash in on the success of these mega-franchises, they were still plopped back into a very different cinema landscape, one that was becoming more and more normalized on a smaller screen. Chris Evans was able to transfer his success as Captain America into a directorial debut with the film Before We Go. But if this had happened in the late 90s or early 2000s, that film would have likely had a big screen release and a major marketing push. 
but this being the modern era, it got a film festival run and then quietly released to small screens via streaming with little fanfare or awareness. Or if you play Star-Lord, your reward for the massive success of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies is an invitation to star in even more massive franchises like Jurassic World, The Lego Movie, and Super Mario Bros., where the franchise remains the draw, not the actor. There's an old saying in the business, one for them, one for me. The meaning behind this being that actors and filmmakers desire to pursue more artistically satisfying projects, but realizing that in order to do this, they must satisfy the studio's needs to make lots and lots of money first, hoping for a reward for playing ball. But instead of being rewarded with more artistically satisfying material, the one for them turns into another one for them, and another and another, until your entire career is a giant favor to the Hollywood studios. Or in the case of Chris Evans, your artistic endeavor ends up on a streaming service, buried under the mountain of content. Josh Hartnett seemed to intuitively understand this, and took a step back from the machine in order to keep his integrity intact. I like to think he understood a fundamental truth of the business. Comic book movies used to be an anomaly. They were supposed to be the dessert that came after the balanced diet of cinema Hollywood was able to balance with their need to make money. Actors like Michael Keaton, Sylvester Stallone, Wesley Snipes, Hugh Jackman, Jim Carrey, George Clooney, and Arnold Schwarzenegger were able to don the disguises of these comic book heroes, but were still able to use those successes to further their careers as big screen stars and remain on the A-list. But at what cost? How many big budget generic studio blockbusters must one do to keep this going? Almost every actor I just mentioned has struggled to remain on top despite foregoing their artistic desires for a large paycheck in more Hollywood career currency. Again, Hartnett seemed to understand this harsh truth. And even upon his return to the Hollywood spotlight, he has remained smart about his choices, bouncing between Guy Ritchie's excellent Wrath of Man to Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer to the Netflix phenomenon Black Mirror, of which he turns in a haunting performance. Hartnett seems comfortable carving out well-crafted, memorable characters in place of being the center of attention. He is a case study in being healthy in a very morally turbulent industry. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe button as I'll be posting more content in the future. Thanks for watching.